All right. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. And we are live for some AP Euro review. Good to see we've got some folks in here already getting the chat going. And we've already got some questions there. Okay, good, good. My BFF, Emily, it never disappoints. Never, though. Thank you so much um, for supplying these questions from Tallahassee. And Tejas, uh, you are new here. And I'm not uh, sure I've uh, seen you around here before, but you've already got a question and there we go okay so okay well let's go ahead and start with that okay so tejas welcome our area of emphasis now remember for those of you who have not been here before now we've got a group uh, in these euro sessions that tends to be pretty uh, pretty dedicated you know how things go uh, so as far as that goes our emphasis area is the revolutions of 1848 and so questions around, you know, on that topic would get priority, but you can also ask questions about other topics related to AP Euro. And if you like questions that are being asked, um, when you, your name, you get pronounced wrong. Okay. Well, I, you know, if you want to come on, on live and, you know, let me go ahead and do, let me see if you want to uh, come on screen and tell me how to pronounce your name. Nobody ever accepts an on-screen invitation, but as far as that goes, uh, let's see if this person will, uh, will accept an on-screen invitation. So remember that first priority questions about the revolutions of 1848, the more specific, uh, the better, but Emily, not too, too specific, right? Uh, but then uh, as far as that questions around the same period and and then if there are upvoted questions that are from other periods, I'll certainly do those as well. I'm totally open to those. So as far as that, uh, what we've got here, let me go ahead and kind of introduce the revolutions of 1848. Now, some of you may have or may not have watched my video already on that topic, but you know, it never hurts to get a little review and I'm not going to go through the whole thing. Now, I've got a five part lecture that the whole thing weighs in at about half an hour. And so as far as that goes, uh, the revolutions of 1848, I'm not going to get uh, to get that deep into it um, in this session, but I will go ahead and introduce it because some of the questions, I think we need some uh, some basic stuff here to kind of bring that in. OK, so I'm going to go ahead and share my screen and give you a quick little introduction to the revolutions of 18. As far as what you really need to know for OK, so here is our map of Europe in 1848. Now, as far as what we're looking at here, we've got France, Italy and the German states. OK, now the German states are Prussia, Austria. And of course, you've got the Austrian Empire here. Uh, and then you've got all of these other states in the German Confederation, okay? So when we're thinking about this, uh, now the most prominent of the revolutions of 1848 is gonna be here in France. And then of course, uh, in the German states, including the Austrian Empire, and then there are revolutions in Italy. Now, the UK, Britain, the Ottoman Empire, looks like you got a little bit of something there, but not so much seeing that, uh, that you don't really have it. So really your focus areas here are France, Italy, and the German states, okay? Now, as far as the revolutions of 1848, there are three takeaways here. Now, first of all, several European nations were swept by a series of simultaneous revolutions, okay? So there are all of these revolutionary movements that are happening all at once, that the pot is boiling over and it's boiling over everywhere. Uh, these revolutions, too, these revolutions generally failed and conservatives regained power, okay? So the revolutions happened, but typically the revolutionaries were not able to form a permanent coalition of power and conservatives regained power. <clears throat> and three, Britain and Russia did not experience the revolutions that otherwise swept over the continent, okay? Now, this represents the end of the age of Metternich, all right? So remember that the age of Metternich is 1815 to 1848, okay? So that's what you're looking at there. And so now it's kind of the overthrow in some ways, but then there is the reassertion of it as well. Uh, it's a significant challenge, we could say, to Metternich's conservative order. And part of the problem here 
for the revolutionaries is that they're not on one page ideologically. Now, conservatives at this time are pretty much in agreement as to what they want. Now, liberals, their goals were to limit church influence and state power. They wanted representative government and economic freedom and civil liberties. Meanwhile, the nationalists, they wanted national unity based on common language, culture, religion, and shared history. And then you've got the radicals that we could divide between the Democrats and the socialists. Now, the Democrats uh, are people who wanted universal male suffrage. Now, remember that liberals, okay, like when we think about classical liberals, Liberals and conservatives, what they have in common is that they believe property to be sacrosanct, okay? And a lot of liberals at that time in the early 19th century, a lot of classical liberals were very suspect of, a lot of classical liberals were very suspect of universal suffrage because that includes people without property. And what's going to happen if you allow people who don't own property to vote, they are going to vote to take property away from other people and to use the government to redistribute wealth. Now, of course, the socialists don't see anything wrong with that. Um, they want worker ownership of the means of production. And so what's going to happen here is there are all these different groups that want to overthrow the conservative order. But then once that conservative order order is overthrown, these groups don't play together very well. And that's why the conservatives are going to be able to reestablish themselves. So as far as that goes, ladies and gentlemen, that is a just a, an introduction to the revolutions of 1848. Now, as far as that, what were some reactions in the rest of the world due to the revolutions? Now, I don't see how that is relevant, okay? I, like, that's when, when I look at this, uh, I think the revolutions of 1848 are much more of an internal phenomenon. Now, if you want to get into United States history, then you could get into, uh, there were people that came over at this time that were called 48ers, okay? There was actually the uh, one of the few people uh, that was court-martialed and executed after the Civil War was the Confederate commander of the Andersonville prison, uh, where a lot of uh, Union prisoners had starved to death or nearly starved to death, um, not necessarily because they were willfully being mistreated, is because there was just nothing to feed them. Uh, and, you know, at one point, I believe this commandant, who was a 48er, like he was somebody who came from Austria and then was placed in command of this, uh, you know, of this prison. And there was one point, I believe he sent a delegation like of prisoners to the north to say like, hey, we, we really need you to send some food here for your prisoners. Uh, but after the war, he was hanged because a lot of people had suffered very greatly at that Andersonville prison. He was a 48er. OK, so there are people who are leaving. Uh, the German states as a result of these revolutions. But as far as like what these overseas like people thought about what was going on there, uh, I don't see that as necessarily relevant to what's going on here, which really, remember, this is part of my job is to tell you that, okay, don't focus on this instead focus on this, okay? So what you wanna focus on is the interplay between all of these different ideological groups and what I've told you about these revolutions, uh, you know, not necessarily, not being that, uh, that successful, okay? So as far as that, now, should we include the suffrage movement here? Um, that, yeah, I'd, that had not occurred to us, dude. Uh, just uh, that, yeah, that that's that just came like out of out of nowhere. I wouldn't really get into. I mean, I just really, when it comes down to it, uh, now of course that that could be something that I could could look into. But I discuss feminism, of course, in the context of the French Revolution, um, and then I typically don't really revisit it until the turn of the 20th century. Uh, that's probably going to be, you know, going to be the next time where I get into talking about, uh, you know, Emmeline Pankhurst, that sort of thing. Now, if somebody, uh, you know, showed me how that was, uh, you know, directly relevant, it might be, but I just, yeah, I'm not, because the thing about it is in U.S. history, the Seneca Falls Convention occurred in 
1848. Okay, so which, of course, that's the same year as the revolutions of 1848. But yeah, I don't know if I necessarily see a literal connection. But you know, that's that was certainly an interesting question. Okay, so how many countries had a revolution in 1848? Now, of course, this is going to be at face value, it could be a very difficult question to answer uh, because we are looking at this from the perspective of uh, you know what what constitutes a country so we could think about the you know the various German states are they all countries or not now what I do in my in my lecture uh, series that I've got on YouTube is I focus on I've got a section focusing on France and yeah I guess I had to get some cough drops so I can sleep if anybody's you know I'm sure people are like what's on his hand what's on his hand all right so uh, you know I focus one in one segment on France another segment on the German states and another segment segment on Italy. And I do think that the Italy, the Italy and Germany are so especially important because the revolutions of 1848 is really kind of a watershed moment in the history of Italian and German unification. And so before 1848, uh, the Italian unification movement is largely, you know, run, is largely uh, being run by Mazzini, Giuseppe Mazzini, and Garibaldi, uh, the military commander, was in league with Mazzini. Now, in 1848, they're like, all right, let's go to Rome and let's ca let's capture it and let's do, you know, da 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 all that. And they go to Rome and then the reactionary forces come in, uh, you know, some of these, uh, you know, with foreign, foreign influences. Like, that's one thing you can see in this map, which uh, is available on Wikipedia uh, and in my slideshow and video. But it's also, I mean, I got it off Wikipedia, I'm pretty sure, um, where all good things come from, you know. But the Austrians, like, send people into Italy, the, you know, the bourbon send uh you know send troops in italy the, so the french the austrians you've got all this foreign intervention there and so garibaldi is thinking like yeah you know we tried this romantic like going into rome and reclaiming our country and it didn't work out so much and so after that uh garibaldi becomes more pragmatic and then of course uh for germany uh when you look at the revolutions of 1848 in the german states the Frankfurt Parliament uh, in 1848 tried to unify Germany on the basis of a legislature. Uh, you know, wanted to create a constitutional monarchy, and that didn't work out. And so then you see Bismarck steps in, and it's going to be more of a practical, military, real politic kind of thing. So I think that that's important as well. So France, you want to focus on because that's uh, you know where Louis Napoleon takes power and that sort of thing, um, and then. Italy and the German states. And then, of course, in Austria as well, uh, you know, it's not really if you're asking for your question to be upvoted, is it really that important? Um, you know, think about it. But anyway, as far as as far as that goes, uh, then in Austria, you, of course, got like the Hungarian revolt that the Hungarians are trying to create their own uh, their own country and the Russians come in and crush that. OK. And then, of course, with Britain and Russia, um, all you have to really understand there is with Britain. At this point, we've already discussed the Chartist and how, uh, you know, even though the Chartist petition isn't being received by Parliament per se, they are passing the Mines Act and, uh, you know, and other acts. So you're repealing the Corn Laws, uh, the 10 Hour Act. These acts are being passed, which is, you know, there's a great Chartist meeting around, you know, a big protest, but not a revolutionary movement. Now, for the Russians, it's a much different story. Okay, for the Russians, it's just the Decemberist revolt was was repressed with such vigor that the Russians just really weren't, uh, you know, ready for that. And also remember that Russia is also not as urbanized of a country either, and more of an autocracy uh, than the other European countries. So, so I would focus on three, but I also would focus on, uh, you know, the you know the whole phenomenon of why not Britain, why not Russia, and for two different, you know, two very different reasons. All right. Um, Tejas or Tejas or whatever you're, uh, you know, you're telling me I, re I mispronounced your name. Uh, what are we talking about post-war? Post what war? Okay, like that's one of those things that, you know, it's just like, what, what are we talking about here? Let's, let's try to be, let's try to be specific here. <coughs> All right. 
And so as far as that, uh, as far as that goes now, I believe that the unification movements, let me just, let me just check on that. Not that I can't, uh, not that I can't uh, talk about that uh, now, but let me just, uh, yeah, it, I'll be doing, focusing on the unification movements sometime in February, I'm sure. But at the same time, why not answer a question, especially uh, it's got an upvote and Emily's um, almost always good to me, right? And so the Austro-Prussian War and the Franco-Prussian War, first of all, we want to understand those as both being wars of German unification. Uh, this is my, this is in the third part of my lecture on German unification, which is titled Blood and Iron. Um, and so, you know, Bismarck comes to the conclusion that the only way that Prussia is going to take this uh, leadership position in the German states, which remember that was his goal. Okay. So, uh, you know, Bismarck was not about, you know, everybody holding hands and, you know, a nationalist. I mean, Bismarck was a conservative, okay. As far as, you know, his own personal uh, credentials, you know, he's a very conservative guy and he wants Prussia to have a leadership position among the German states. That's his priority. And so as far as that goes, uh, you know, where he's thinking that, that the only way we're going to do that, that we're going to get other German states to go along with us is through warfare. And so Austria had to be put in their place, OK, because you had the greater Germany or big Germany. Gross Deutschland, okay, which was the idea that all German speaking people should be put into one country with each other. Bismarck didn't like that because that includes Austria. All right. Um, all right. Well, glad I can help you, Nolan. Glad I can help you. And so, as far as that, you know, it includes Austria, and Prussia doesn't want to have to deal with that. Bismarck, that's not what Bismarck wants. And so the Austro-Prussian War is essentially, I mean, Prussia has gotten into the Industrial Revolution, like the Second Industrial Revolution. Uh, by World War I, Germany has become the largest industrial producer in Europe. Now, the United States by that time has become the single largest. Uh, but Prussia has created this modern industrialized militaristic state, whereas Austria has not modernized to nearly that extent. So they call that the seven weeks war that it's really it happens very quickly and Prussia goes in there with its allies you know this North German confederation with other Protestant states and after going to war together that brings them together okay that it's that it's essentially like you know a uh you know a nation that uh, I mean when you when you kill together like you are you know, you're, you're doing something, you're forming a bond, I suppose, you know, kids don't go out and start trying to kill people as a social activity or anything like that. But when it comes to, uh, when it comes to warfare, uh, you know, the people that go to war together, that's creating those bonds. Okay. And then the Franco Prussian war is like, well, Austria has been defeated, but there are still the Bavarians and from those other Southern German states that, are Catholic and they're not quite excited about being in one country with the North, you know, Protestant North Germany dominated by Prussia. And so Bismarck has this idea that I'm going to go to war with France uh, to kind of complete this, this thing here. And he even figured out how to get France to start it uh, with the Ems dispatch, like basically like, you know, here, I'm going to get you to actually start this war. So it doesn't look like we started it. And so then the Franco Prussian war, uh, which is, uh, you know, which concludes pretty quickly as well. Uh, now, after the Franco-Prussian War is pretty interesting. I've got a friend who teaches in California, and he talks about like, I mean, really where we say World War I, World War II, um, he sees the whole thing as like a three-act drama, like where the Franco-Prussian War is actually the first one of these wars, you know? So you've got the Franco-Prussian War, and then you've got World War I and then World War II. And sure enough, after the Franco-Prussian War, okay, that uh, Prussia goes to the Hall of Mirrors to proclaim their their German empire. So they go into Louis XIV's Hall of Mirrors at Versailles and they proclaim the German empire. Then they make France pay war reparations. And then finally, they take Alsace-Lorraine because that was a German-speaking province. Now, bear in mind that uh, th that 
Bismarck didn't think this was wise, but he had to yield the pressure on this one that it's like we have to take that back because that is uh, German speaking territory. Um, that's something that Louis the Fourteenth had had annexed during his time as king. And so what you see here is essentially after World War One, you see this turned on its head. Where did they sign the treaty after World War One? The Treaty of Versailles. Let's go to the Hall of Mirrors. Remember this, Germany. There you go reparations. Germany had made France pay reparations. Now France was going to put that back on Germany. And then finally, we'll take Alsace-Lorraine back, okay? And of course, at the same time, you know, you go to World War II and Hitler has the French sign their surrender agreement in the same railroad car where Germany had had to sign uh, the armistice, which had begun its humiliation after World War I. So the Franco-Prussian War, excuse me, World War One and World War II can all form like, you know, really kind of a, a trilogy um, of sorts, uh, you know, even though the Franco-Prussian War often gets, uh, oh, I'm sorry, I'm just, good Lord, the hiccups, all right. Uh, so as far as that goes, you know, really kind of a prelude to the world wars. <coughs> Break down the relationship between Great Britain and Ireland leading up and during the famine. Okay. Um, I briefly hit on this uh, during in my lecture on the Corn Laws uh, that essentially the Corn Laws were, of course, this, uh, this protective tariff, this artificial import tax on imported grain from the continent. And this artificially raised the price of food. Now, Ireland, something that I've got to look a little more into. I've got to be, I'm going to be very honest about that, uh, that I need to learn the difference between like an Irish Republican and an Irish nationalist. I mean, it just, it's, it really kind of gets my, uh, get, makes my head spin. Uh, but as far as that goes, uh, ladies and gentlemen, we've got time. We've got time. We'll get there. We'll get there. Okay. Well, y'all just, y'all, y'all chill out. Now, remember the whole point of upvoting, the whole point of upvoting. Um, is to, you know, for this to be natural, okay, that you're trying to make a command economy work, okay, that you're trying marketing strategies, but really we need to let the invisible hand do this, okay, so it's not so much can someone upvote my question, the whole point of upvoting is that somebody is seeing this, and, and I would invite everybody to occasionally sc scroll through the questions, and if you like a question, upvote it, okay? But asking for your question to be upvoted, you're asking to manipulate the whole process, okay? Which which it gets in the way of the marketplace of ideas. Um, so, I'm, you know, here I am uh, sounding off like a classical liberal here, right? So, just, uh, just keep that in mind that this really needs to be an organic process. If you asked a good question, it will be upvoted. Oh, that's that's okay. But yeah, just uh, and and as we start to see more people, as we get to the exam, uh, this is going to get a lot bigger. And so we just have to make sure that we're playing by you know set rules. Uh, so just just continue to keep that in mind. Ask a good question; it'll get upvoted if other people want to see that question answered. Uh, so as far as that goes, I started watching Dairy Girls uh, on uh, on Netflix, uh, which is really quick. You can watch it in three hours. I uh, got to turn the subtitles on because it's like really like thick Irish accents, but it is hilarious. But uh, what's not hilarious is the potato famine, right? Um, and so what's going on here is the potato famine actually played a role in the repeal of the corn laws because one of the things, like when you think about pathos, logos, and ethos, uh, people are like, how is it that we can have these corn laws that have been here for like 30 years and everybody hated them, or at least, you know, everybody that didn't own land and wasn't benefiting from them, that uh, you know, they, there had been all these protests against the Corn Laws, but finally, when the famine happens, people are like, are we really going to raise the price of grain when there are people starving? Um, so when the when the Corn Laws are repealed under the administration of Sir Robert Peel, so repeal, get it, uh, but even though it's P-E-E-L, but as far as that goes, under Sir Robert Peel, they're repealed now. Repealing the Corn Laws did not have a significant effect on the Irish uh, famine. Now I need to I need to learn a bit more about the history of Ireland. That that is something that I'm not quite so you know. Which even now Ireland's kind of getting into the news with the Brexit backstop thing. Uh, that's that's got to be kind of interesting there. So thank you, uh, Emily, for that question. All right. 
Uh, I still don't know what we're to post war. What in the devil are you talking about? All right. Uh, typically, when we say post war, okay. So typically, when we say post war, we're talking about world post World War II is kind of the default here. All right. Uh, but remember, in the 19th century, you really don't have a big, significant, like a truly continental war between the Napoleonic Wars and World War One. Okay. Can I talk about what Austria wanted at the Congress of Vienna? Now, here's a question that this is a little bit behind where our area of emphasis is, but I see we've got uh, several people that want that answer. Now, remember that I've got an exhaustive list of videos on YouTube about the Congress of Vienna. I've got now the Congress of Vienna. I've got a lecture on it. I've got the Metternich rap. Uh, that uh, you know goes in to answer the answers this question, and then I've got a meditation that I that I made a guided meditation about the Congress of Vienna. So I think now I've got three distinct videos uh, on the Congress of Vienna on my YouTube channel. So as far as that, I mean, Austria is wanting to restore the balance of power. The same thing all the great powers want that, uh, you know, you've had this very chaotic and tumultuous period with the French Revolution. And so let's, uh, you know, let's let's get on away from that. OK, that, you know, it's it's time to, uh, you know, it's, it's time to get, uh, you know, to time to get past that. It's time to have stability within states and stability between states okay so those are the two things that you want to uh that you want to note here stability within states and stability between states okay so i mean that's the conservative wants stability and wants to see institutions uh protected okay they want to see institutions protected they want to see things stable and so remember france france wasn't punished but france is returned to its 1791 borders okay so instead of uh you know like after world war one what you're going to see is there is a uh, there is an effort to punish germany and make sure that germany can't ever make war again or at least uh so they thought right um you know but uh, as far as this, they're wanting to avoid war. They're wanting to avoid civil unrest. They're wanting to avoid, uh, you know, really roll back the progress of liberalism and nationalism. Okay, because those are the two big themes of the French Revolution. That the French Revolution was instigated largely by liberals and nationalists, and so conservatism was trying to, you know, and then during the age of Metternich, you saw where there was a lot of repression when it came to the the uh, the Burschenschaften, these uh, these student groups that were, uh, you know, that were very uh, active at that time, and Metternich was like, nope, not going to do that, and uh, so took action against them. All right, so we've got uh, we've got that one answered, and then again, okay, um, the Dreyfus affair. Okay, now the Dreyfus affair. This is a a really uh, you know fascinating one one for me. Um, as far as uh, as far as the Dreyfus affair, uh, you know this it, this goes into like when we think about nationalism and you know, getting people to assimilate and, you know, on the basis of a common language and culture. Now, when we go back to the Middle Ages, uh, you know, Hitler wasn't the first person to get Jews to wear distinctive clothing. Like in the Middle Ages, this had been, you know, Jews were uh, supposed to, uh, you know, Jews at that time, you know, in the Middle Ages, they wore distinctive clothing. Um, and, you know, they lived in a separate part of town. Um, but what you're starting to see is that now, of course, at the start of this course, Jews couldn't even legally live in a lot of European countries. You know, remember Ferdinand and Isabella, when they took over, um, they expelled the Jews from Spain unless they were willing to convert to Catholicism. And so what you're seeing in the 19th century is an effort by Jews in order to uh, Jews in order to. Uh, assimilate. And so Dreyfus uh, was really like this, uh, you know, one of these like kind of a poster boy for uh, the 19th century assimilating Jew that he, uh, you know, he got a military commission. He was a military officer. And then there was some kind of espionage. The Germans had got some kind of secrets or something like that. And then so Dreyfus was accused of selling secrets to the Germans. And of course, uh, you know, when he's put on trial, it's like, well, he's a Jew. What more do 
we need to know. I mean, there's there was a whole lot of anti-Semitism uh, that you saw there. And then, of course, there were people that defended Dreyfus. Now, uh, you know, you had um, Emile Zola, Z-O-L-A, who was a, a, a popular writer at that time, that he, uh, you know, published this uh, thing, J'accuse, J'accuse, or whatever. It's like basically I accuse in English. That's a lot easier for me to say, right? It's a written test. Uh, but with that, uh, you know, you have the Dreyfusards and the anti Dreyfusards. All right. So you've got people who are for and against him. And it becomes really this kind of flashpoint. Uh, it's almost like if you think about like the O.J. Simpson trial in the 1990s, uh, you know, how that was a flashpoint for race. And so there's this uh, this back and forth. And then there's some evidence that comes out that pretty much exonerates uh, Dreyfus, who had been sent to Devil's Island in the Caribbean, uh, you know, just to uh, to suffer out there. Of course, today, the Caribbean's a really nice place, but some of these places weren't so nice back then uh, before they had, uh, you know, before you didn't have to worry about getting malaria and stuff. But Dreyfus was retried and then reconvicted. Like, the jury convicted him again. So it's just like, wait, I mean, we've got evidence that, you know, justified having a retrial and he's convicted again. I think finally, like the president had to pardon him or something like that. It was something that, uh, you know, is kind of embarrassing uh, for France looking back on it. Uh, but the thing is that the Dreyfus affair, it's like it, it it is the bigger issue here. And this is where you get into like Theodore Herzl, the, uh, you know, the father of Zionism, who wrote uh, Der, Der Judenstaat, OK, the Jewish state. And he wrote a uh, he wrote a book here. I've already I've already quoted the Big Lebowski one time uh, in this uh, you know in this session. But why not another? You know where Walter's like you know if you will it, dude, it is no dream. Theodore Herzl, State of Israel, and you know Theodore Herzl, if you will it, it is no dream. And Theodore Herzl came to the conclusion that Jews have tried to assimilate into European culture and have failed, that European culture will never accept Jews. And so you get into this uh, this Jewish nationalist movement um, and this idea that the Jews need to have a homeland, whether it's in Palestine or whether it's somewhere else, but the Jews need their own nation because no other nation will have them. Uh, what Herzl says is that you know, the Jews will flee an intolerant country to a more tolerant country. And then when more Jews come into the more tolerant country, then people in that more tolerant country start uh, lashing out at the Jews and that country becomes less tolerant. And he says, until the Jews have somewhere they can go that is theirs, uh, you know, and it goes along with that whole theme of nationalism. So, you know, the Dreyfus affair should be kind of examined in the context of this Zionist movement that is really picking up steam at the same time because the Dreyfus affair convinces a lot of Jews that they can't assimilate. And of course, you see what happened uh, in World War II. Um, and so as far as that goes, uh, you know, in at the turn of the 20th century, 90 percent of Jews lived in Europe. Uh, and today, 90 percent of Jews live either in the United States or in Israel. Uh, so the thing is, you've seen a lot of uh, I mean, I think the Dreyfus affair just has a lot of far reaching consequences, uh, you know, when you see what's uh, what's happened with the Jews and getting, you know, basically getting out of Europe. So with that, let's go to the uh, to the next one. Uh, yeah. So overall, yeah, overall, these are failures. OK, so, for example, the Frankfurt Parliament meets and, you know, it's like, OK, well, we can't get the king of Prussia to agree to be king of a unified constitutional monarchy that's based on liberal nationalism. So it's like, all right, well, can't do that. Now, also, you start to see that there are some radical elements in these coalitions and people who are moderate start to drift more toward the conservatives. And so in France, what happens is Louis Napoleon is elected as president of France. So they declare uh, the second French Republic. And then well, then look, uh, look what happens. He said, uh, I mean, he's a Bonaparte, right? So he proclaims himself to be the emperor of France and France then has the second French empire and Napoleon III, uh, you know, allies more and more with conservatives. 
And so that one is a failure. Then you look at Italy where there's foreign intervention and that one's a failure. Yeah, so so pretty consistently they are failing. Metternich fled to, fled to England and then a few years later went back to Austria where it was safe for him again, okay? So pretty much everything that, that happened, it was kind of like the Joseph II, I guess, of, of revolutions that, yeah, at the end of the day, they pretty much, uh, they pretty much failed. Um, you know, Emily, that is, I, I don't know. I've never even heard of this. I, I'm not, I'm not sure what, I mean, that this is a new one on me, which I'm going to gather means that it's probably not something uh, that you're going to need to worry about for the exam. Okay. So I, yeah, I, I would say no, because I don't know the details of it. Okay. So yeah, I wouldn't get, I mean, I think the Congress of Vienna should be, uh, should be plenty. Um, for that. And then knowing that, you know, that might have something to do with the Holy Alliance since it has to do with Alexander and Metternich. So as far as that goes, yeah, I don't think that would be something. It uh, sounds like something I'd like to investigate, but not something that's going to be on the exam. And so then as far as that goes, let's uh, let's take a look here. Um, Greek independence, okay, the Greek independence movement in Europe um, is significant because it's kind of the first challenge to the conservative order. And and while we while we're here, uh, you know, I've got a. This is one of those that I've got pretty much. Uh, and you know, I may need to do this. Try to have this for March twenty, like in advance of March twenty fifth. I always say it's one of those that I've got about like ninety percent finished, but. It's just, uh, yeah, I, I've got about 90% finished, but I never finish it. And then I'm like, oh, I'm going to do it for Greek Independence Day next year or something like that. And I never do. So let me just uh, let me just show you a few key points of this. But it's really the first challenge to the conservative order, because, you know, what you see here now, this is this is always something that I'll that I'll lead off with uh, George Stephanopoulos and Dr. Oz. You know, you've got a Greek American and a Turkish American. Okay. So you've got a Greek American, Turkish American, and they look like they could be related, right? I mean, there's really, when you look at a Greek and a Turk, you're not really seeing something that is, wow, these people look a lot different. But there's this comedian on YouTube uh, that, uh, you know, dresses up like this Greek diner owner, uh, you know, really traditional and all that. And it's it's funny. He talks about never call a Greek a Turk. And he's explaining why you should never call a Greek a Turk. And, you know, there's a lot of bad blood between the Greeks and the Turks. Now, also, this plays into the decline of the Ottoman Empire. All right, so the Ottoman Empire reached its uh, its zenith at uh, in 1683. All right, this is where it is knocking on the door of the Austrian Empire. I mean, you look at a lot of uh, you know a lot of Hungary is under the Ottoman Empire at that point, and so then you see that uh, you know the Habsburgs and the Russians start to drive the Ottoman Empire back. This is what it looks like by 1812, okay? So during the Napoleonic Wars, this is the Ottoman Empire. It has shrank just a little bit. Now, by 1914 or 1913, on the eve of World War I, this is the Ottoman Empire. So whether it's Greek independence or the Crimean War, you see these episodes in the 19th century that are bringing about the decline of the Ottoman Empire. And remember, of course, uh, part of that too, the Ottoman Empire losing in North Africa, part of that is European imperialism in Africa. So the Greeks, uh, they declare their independence uh, against the Ottoman Empire. And initially, all of the governments of the great powers, uh, they refuse to recognize Greece, okay? They refuse to recognize Greece because they want stability, kind of the opposite of what you see in some cases, like right now, what's going on in Venezuela. Um, looks like it's going to turn into chaos with different countries, uh, you know, recognizing different presidents there. But pretty much the great powers of Europe were united because for conservatives, you know, the conservative establishment in all of these countries, they thought that, you know, this is going to be the French Revolution part two. Meanwhile, liberals, nationalists, and romantics all thought this was a great idea. It promotes liberty. It creates a nation. It's very beautiful. Uh, and so, and Emily, I've got an, an, uh, a 
version of the Greek uh, Declaration of Independence. If you email me, I'll, I'll send it to you. I don't think I've got it posted online yet, even though I need to sometime. But these liberals, romantics, and nationalists, they start to, uh, you know, they start to reach for public opinion. Because remember, you know, Europeans, I mean, they're still that kind of humanist streak. Like for me, I mean, I love ancient Greece and Rome. Uh, you know, and Europeans felt the same way, especially when they were still receiving, you know, when their elites were still receiving classical educations. And so massacres are committed on both sides. But um, Europeans, you know, this one was especially like they, the Turks, uh, they executed the Patriarch of Constantinople on Easter Sunday. Okay, Easter Sunday, 1821, they executed the Patriarch of Constantinople. So you see that this is, uh, you know, this is really riling up Europeans. Um, Eugene Delacroix, uh, who painted Liberty Leading the People, also painted several, uh, you know, several scenes of Greek independence, and you see these emaciated Greeks. Now, note here that you see the Turks drawn, you know, they're colored a lot darker than the Greeks. Uh, the Greeks are portrayed to look more like uh, like Europeans here. And of course, uh, you know, you see that there is, uh, there is Greece uh, on the ruins here. And Notice, you know, she looks like a white European woman. She's got a nice bosom there. And then there is this jet black Turk back there. So, you know, this, uh, you know, you can see that there's certainly a propaganda element here. And also the Phil Hellenic societies, basically the societies of people who love Greece, they start raising money and they start sending this money uh, to, uh, to Greece. And of course, the Russians public opinions with the Greeks because of their shared Orthodox Christianity. And so the Greeks end up by, you know, their independence is recognized by the London Protocol in 1832. I need to do something with it. This is part of like that 10% that's not quite finished. So March 25th was, it, you know, is Greek Independence Day. Now it is also on the Greek Orthodox Church calendar. It is the uh, the celebration of the Annunciation of the Virgin Mary by the angel Gabriel. And so for the Greeks, you know, this represents a beginning. So the Feast of the Annunciation is also when the Greeks celebrate their own independence. It's like the angels coming to them and saying, you know, your nation's coming back. Uh, their national motto, you know, a, mo a nod to liberalism, like when you look at the Greek flag, for example, you see that it's got a cross and it shows their shared religion, but it also is made to look a lot like the American flag. And so their motto, um, Eleutheria Athanatos, liberty or death, right there from Patrick Henry. And so Greece ends up, uh, you know, Greece ends up negotiating a boundary that's really not nearly what, I mean, when you think about where ethnic Greeks live, okay, this is very small, but the Greeks take the victory at the time, okay? So in 1832, uh, the great powers negotiate uh, this boundary that left a lot of ethnic Greeks under Ottoman rule. And so in 1829, there's the Ottoman Empire. And then there, there really, there are a lot of people who are not, they're not uh, sold on this. Okay. So the Magale, kind of like when you think about um, big Germany, little Germany, Gross Deutschland, Klein Deutschland, um, you had the Magale, the big idea. Okay. Mega in Greece is big, right? And so the idea of big Greece, what they wanted was all of the places where there were ethnic Greeks, uh, they wanted a Greek nation with a capital at Constantinople, okay, to go back to um, the capital of the Byzantine Empire. So that was what they really wanted. And over time, they did get, uh, you know, some of this. But then again, um, you know, they, they got this after World War I. Looks like some of this has seeded. So over time, um, they're getting things, but they never quite reach Constantinople, which the Turks today call Istanbul. But at the time, I believe everybody was still calling Constantinople. Constantinople. And so over time, you know, they've, uh, you know, this yellow stuff has been given back. Um, and at the same time, you see in 1923, what's decided is that they have a population exchange, basically a forced repatriation of Turks living in Greece 
and Greeks living in Turkey. And so as far as that goes, of course, uh, you know, in the United States, we, uh, you know, have Greek communities like the Greek church still is a very much a community center for, uh, you know, for Greeks and Greek festivals and, of course, Greek movies uh, like My Big Fat Greek Wedding. I love that movie. And, you know, we see where, you know, Greeks today in the United States still have a very, very powerful sense of identity. So a uh, little bit about Greek independence. All right. So one of these days I'll put that on my uh, YouTube channel, just like some point I'll do a video on the British Empire. OK, so, Drew, at, at some point I will definitely look into that. OK, now, um, as far as um nation building in the u.s i'm not not sure that i understand that question completely emily but um i don't think a lot it doesn't sound like a very big uh very big topic um for the ap euro exam but uh you know they say that they're trying to globalize the course but at the same time it's still pretty much a course in european history um i think they've tried to make it look more globalized but you know in reality i mean it's it's still a course on european history um, from what I can see, at least um, the Russian Revolution of 1905. Now, I'm going to say that that is the Russian Revolution is not one of my strongest suits. Um, but the Russian Revolution of 1905 is when Russia becomes a constitutional monarchy. OK, one of these days I should tackle this in a video, do a little more research. Just by the time it gets to the 20th century, I'm in review mode. And a lot of times I'm just not doing like as much research or making as many videos and that sort of thing. Um, the Russian Revolution of 1905 uh, is, yeah, it's like basically uh, Nicholas II gives up the his autocratic powers and authorizes a state Duma. Now, he still had, I believe, a veto power. So it's not like the czar is giving up all of his power, but the czar was authorizing the formation of a state Duma. And that is, of course, following Russia's humiliating loss in the Russo-Japanese War, uh, which, uh, you know, which was just embarrassing because no European power had ever been defeated by a an Asian or African power before. Uh, so as far as that goes, uh, losing to Japan really humiliated Russia, cost them a lot of money too, because they lost a lot of uh, a lot of navy in that. And uh, you know that's leading to that revolution of 1905. What is necessary to know about um, Hungary's role. Okay. Yeah. I don't, you know, the, really, I don't think the inner workings of the Austrian empire are necessarily that, you know, all that important, but, uh, but as far as that goes, uh, Hungary's role. Yeah. I, I tell you, I don't really know a lot about it. One of these days I will, but there we go. All right. So how popular was socialism among the working class? Now, this is a this is a really interesting question, OK, because because here's the thing, like Karl Marx initially said, like, you know, this is my theory of how things are going to happen, that you've got this class oppresses, this class oppresses, this class oppresses, this class. Now we've got the bourgeoisie, the bourgeoisie They're They're just uh, they're oppressing the proletariat. Right. And the proletariat, they're going to rise up and they're going to do it on their own. They're going to realize that, hey, these people are oppressing us and we're going to independently develop a sense of class consciousness and we're going to overthrow the entire system. OK, now the thing is that, uh, you know, Lenin realized that this is not going to happen. OK, that the working class will not develop a sense of class consciousness on its own. Lenin said that you needed a vanguard party, like basically you need people who are educated coming from like a bourgeois background to explain to the working class what their true interests are and help them develop a class consciousness. Now, the other side of that is that you know and the people's budget is a good good example here isabel that we see time and time again that the working class tends to be pretty conservative like when you look at like blue collar factory workers they tend to be pretty conservative now if they feel like they're being completely screwed over economically they can get rebellious and uneasy right they can get unruly and all of that but as long as like when parliament passed the repeal of the corn laws the Mines Act, the 10 hour act, then the working class in Britain is like, you know what? Those revolutions are going on right now in the, on the continent. We probably don't need to do that because they feel like somebody is listening to their concerns. OK, that, that basically working class people, um, if they feel like there's food on the table, 
they feel like somebody's looking out for them, that there's a safety net somewhere, you know, that they're not starving. They got a roof over their head, something to eat. Um, Socialism doesn't really appeal um, to them. I mean, it's really like when you look at socialist regimes. Now, there are regimes that we refer to as socialist per se, but are really like they're not anymore. Like there, there is they're as capitalistic as they are socialist. I mean, it's it's just somewhere in, in the middle. But you look at like what's going on in Venezuela and it's like, who wants that? Uh, really? And so as far as that goes, the, the so socialism among the working classes, it's really something that tends to be more popular, you know, most popular among bourgeois folk. OK, and that's, you know, when we talk about like completely, you know, destroying the market system, uh, you know, I think that that when it comes down to it, working class people know that as long as there are protections built into the market system to help them, they tend to be OK with that. OK, and that's one of the things when you look at the people's budget. OK, so David Lloyd George, uh, you know, was the prime minister of, uh, you know, of of Britain when, uh, you know, about what was this about 1910? I think it was a little bit before uh, World War One. But the Liberal Party under Gladstone. Now, Gladstone in the late 19th century was kind of like the like he was an old school classical liberal, anti income tax, low government spending, uh, you know, just a minimal role for government in the economy and not a big advocate of a social welfare state. Now the people's budget, David Lloyd George, and this is where you start to see like the evolution of liberalism because David Lloyd George, um, you know, he, he was the head of the liberal party and he almost does in a way like what Bismarck did when you look at, you know, how did Bismarck try to get around the social Democrats? Well, let me go ahead and out socialize the socialist. I'll do the accident insurance, the old age pensions um, and health insurance. Well, you know, with the people's budget, you start to see that like, you know, the British government is very much increasing their, uh, yeah, and hey, Spencer, and uh, yeah, you're welcome, uh, Drew and Nolan, if I haven't said that already. Uh, but as far as that goes, the people's budget is the liberal party kind of becoming, they're what they're trying to do is they're afraid that if they don't do something to placate the working classes, then the labor party will come into power. Now, what we have to understand is today the labor party is a center left party. Um, that doesn't uh, advocate for the abolition of private property or the seizure of the means of production. But the Labor Party at that time was a socialist party. And so the idea of the people's budget is that we need to do something to make sure that, you know, the liberals can stay in power. But in the, you know, in that act, and this is what you have to think about sometimes, the Liberal Party is not like, you know, the Liberal Party really ceased to be a relevant force. And it became the conservative party that started to take on economic liberalism. Uh, and so, you know, it really like ever since, uh, you know, World War One, the Depression, whenever that way, you know, 1920s, I forget when the first, uh, you know, let me see, when was the first, was the first labor in the UK. Okay. So when was the first 1924 um, was the year that the first labor government was formed in the UK. And so as far as that goes, that when we look at, um, you know, at what goes on after that is the liberal party. Um, let's see, prime ministers of the UK. Let me let me share my screen with y'all and let's go ahead and take a look at this, okay? So I'm going to go ahead and pull this up. Let's see what we've got there. Okay. All right, so let's take a look at these prime ministers. Okay, so you've got all these guys with wigs here. All right, so uh, W-I-G-S, right? Because you'll start to see some wig party, right? The Tories and the Whigs. Okay, so these are, you've got the Tories and the Whigs. And then we start to see, let's see, the 1700s, Whigs and Tories, Whigs and Tories, Whigs and Tories, Whigs, 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 right? Now they're not wearing wigs anymore, but there are still wigs here. All right, so uh, the 1700s, and then we start to see, wow, okay. So now we see the first, like, okay, so there's a Peelite, 
um, you know, eight, the 1850s. OK, we start to say, OK, there we go, that the Tories and the Whigs, you know, they're going to about the 1830s. And then you see the Tories rebrand themselves under Sir Robert Peel as the conservative party. And then the Whig party will kind of go into the uh, you'll start to see that in 1859 <clears throat> we have the liberal party okay so then we see the conservative party and the liberal party and so from there conservative liberal conservative liberal um and then we start to whoa okay so as far as that goes uh we see in this so basically david lloyd george okay was uh you know was the you know was the prime minister from 1916 1922 and we start to see that uh you know the liberal party you know even though they're trying to take power and they're trying to keep the labor labor from taking over what do you see here now you see uh, what's going on here with, let's see, so labor, national labor, conservative. And so every government since, uh, you know, since the 19, the mid 20s has been a labor government or a conservative government. And so, you know, be very careful. Uh, you know, there's kind of a lesson here that if you, uh, you know, if you were to, let's see, the people's budget. Okay, because I'm pretty sure that was a Lloyd. George. Yeah, now that's not okay. So Lloyd George must have been the cabinet during this time. Uh, yeah, so David Lloyd George was at this time the Chancellor of the Exchequer. Okay, and so essentially they're they're trying to keep the Liberal Party in power and keep labor out, but within like you know two decades we see a labor government and we'll never see another liberal government again. Uh, you know after World War One. So be very careful if you, you know, if you give up your principles in order to stay in power might work for a little bit, but it's not necessarily going to work for, uh, you know, for forever or anything like that. And so as far as that goes, yeah, I mean, if starting in 1924, you start to see that, uh, you know, you now now the Liberal Party um, is, of course, now they merged with the Social Democratic Party to form the Liberal Democratic Party, which is kind of a, you know, Britain kind of has right now like a two and a half party system, maybe. And then they've got a bunch of like very small regional parties, such as the ones in Northern Ireland. OK, so, yeah, but the people's budget was, you know, a larger budget and kind of a, you know, it's it's really kind of the the liberals are throwing in the towel and like, OK, we're done with the whole classical liberalism thing. All right. Um, yeah, Drew, I wish I I wish I knew a little bit, uh, you know, a little bit more of that. Um, Nolan, I can answer that very quickly. The fundamentals of the Enlightenment are on the exam. Uh, you need to watch my videos on the Enlightenment. OK. And so as far as that goes, uh, Disraeli and Gladstone, um, that's something that I'm not really prepared to answer in this session, but I will uh, do some more looking into it. Now, as far as that goes, though, Disraeli was a big supporter of imperialism, um, where, uh, you know, he had personal favor with Queen Victoria. Gladstone was really the last of like the cla the true classical liberals okay and so uh, so gladstone during his ministry um he disestablished the church of ireland like basically before gladstone came around there was a protestant church that irish people were having to pay taxes to support so as a liberal he felt like that was pretty repugnant and then uh, you know so gladstone was you know was was a classical liberal i'll i'll try to do some more uh, some more on that and try to get something for you um sometime later in uh you know in the month of uh, in the month of february now as far as that uh, goes what are the chances um now a marxian view marxian is another way to say marxist um if you're looking at it from a marxian perspective okay so for example uh if you're looking at the french revolution from a marxian perspective then you're looking at it for, through a class lens okay so you're thinking like okay the bourgeoisie they are you know fighting the nobility the traditional aristocracy to become the dominant class and that becomes like the industrial you know the precursor for the industrial revolution in france yada yada now 
a lot of the Marxian view has been discredited, you know, as far as at least in the economic sphere, uh, that this idea that, you know, when a lot of the more recent scholarship on the French Revolution is showing that, you know, the bourgeoisie already had, you know, there, there had already been some modernization before the French Revolution. And so Marxism basically tries to put everything into this system that Marx concocted, where you have this history of class struggle, and that history should be read through that lens. So anytime somebody is, uh, you know, is looking at that through at history through a class struggle lens, then they're trying to do that. Um, of course, uh, at the same time, there are people talking today about uh, cultural Marxism and stuff that I'm still trying to kind of wrap my brain around, uh, you know, all these words that are going around now. So with that, uh, you know, we're going to go ahead and, uh, you know, it looks like we've got 10 o'clock. Now, remember, ladies and gentlemen, uh, there are lots of free broadcasts we're doing week to week, but this is, you've got a chance now to get five of them plus at a discount from what it'll be closer to the exam. We're going to be doing some of these cram sessions like in the weeks before the exam, and you're going to need to have a ticket to get in. Now, if your teacher's already gotten you on five of them, or you already have five of them plus, we're good, but make sure go to fiveable.me and give uh, you know give fiveable plus a look. So, ladies and gentlemen, thank you for joining us tonight. Glad we'll see you again next week, Drew. And y'all tell your friends. Let's get some people in here. And thank you again, Emily, as always, for getting me started with the questions. Good night, everybody, and it's always a pleasure.